so welcome uh, uh, to our um, Twitter space. So this Twitter space is the beginning of a series of events. Uh, we will talk about the different products that Prime Data has, and we will invite uh, our partners and the people that we have from the community. One moment. And the people that we have from the community to discuss about what are the benefits of being in an ecosystem and uh, what are the future plans that we have. So together we have uh, Zahad and Fig. Uh, Zahad is uh, from Primeda and Fig is uh, one of our beloved partners from Paladin. Uh, so I would love to invite the states firstly to head to tell us a bit more about his experience, how he started, and give us an introduction. Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks for organizing this. Um, so I've been with Prime for almost about a year. Um, met these guys and gals and the end also you know we have a few folks who are also non-binary and all that shout out to them um uh, about a little over a year ago when folks were first organizing around uh, dallas lisbon i was very into the idea that we could basically make the entire dao economy more of a cooperative one um and at a high level that's really what uh what prime is doing right like we are very much interested in using the benefits of competition and cooperation to weave together a more collaborative ecosystem between uh, DAOs and to enable other forms of coordination simply than just buying and holding tokens and all that, right? So um, that's really what we're all about and what our products are all about. And super excited to be here with Pige and Paladin because from our perspective, what they're doing is super interesting for DAO governance in the DeFi space and necessary. And yeah, so we're happy to chat about what they're building, what we're building together. Awesome. Thanks a lot. And what about you, Vic? How would you like to give us a background and uh, tell us a bit more about Balladin too? Yeah, sure. Thanks you for having me first. Uh, I hope the noise is okay. Uh, seems to be. Um, so, I'm one of the co-founders of Paladin uh, Governance Protocol, Governance Management Protocol, we could say. Um, we've been building for the past 18 months. We started in a hackathon at, uh, I think it was if Global, last January. Uh, before that, I used to be a banking lawyer, but uh, we've been full-time trying to help support the growth of governance. Uh, what we're building at Paladin has started from uh, the, the impression that DeFi projects and crypto projects more generally were growing much faster in terms of utility of use than they were in terms of structure, especially the governance structure, and that we would have a, a lot of problems because we were building a multi-millions or multi-billion dollar uh, projects that did not have the right structure to develop and to grow as needed and to, and to organize internally. So we've been trying to build these structures. Um, unfortunately, there's a double problem right now. The first is that crypto used to be extremely speculative until very recently, which meant that if you try to do anything else outside of yield, well, people would not simply not come. And the other reason, which is uh, quite important too, is that most uh, governance opportunities are non-lucrative. If you add a, a, money, uh, a, a paywall, on top of it, you're basically adding friction. And the biggest problem of governance is that there's already too much friction. So we've been trying to experiment around this. We first started with the uh, vote lending uh, uh, markets, which we call influence markets. And we're basically starting to build on top of that net that we're actually becoming uh, more and more lucrative. So yeah, sorry for the big intro. No, Not sorry, necessary, man. <laughs> That's uh, that's amazing. And uh, how long have you been in the space? And uh, yeah, how do you see the behavior around that? Because um, I have been in the governance space for last year, actually. 
And I totally get your point. Do you feel that with this model, people are more interactive and they are keen on to participate? So I would say actually no. Uh, the metric we use a lot that is still quite relevant is that there's roughly 5% of the tokens today in decentralized governance that are actually used to govern it. But there was, uh, I think it was last week, there was a study that was uh, published by Chainalysis that re had revealed that uh, the top 1% uh, holders held roughly 90% of the tokens. So you have a double problem. First one is of distribution, and the second one is of participation. We tried uh, to solve the ones of participation by making fairer distributions where, where founders and investors have smaller shares than they used to have in other products. The problem that we see is that long as you have a free market today, what's going to happen is that naturally the strong holders are going to be institutionals and professionals and the weak holders are going to be retail. That's the second problem of basically sell pressure out of what we call weak hands and retails. And the second one, which is a bit weirder, is out of contributors. It's easier and most projects actually pay their contributors with their own governance token, right? The problem with that is that you can't buy bread or you can't buy rent with your governance token. So you have to sell it at some point. So basically you're giving voting power to people, but they have to sell it to basically pay off their rent. So there's this paradox where we're basically stuck in a universe where our governance system is not entirely adapted to the needs that we have to govern long-term these projects. Gotcha. That's that's totally very, very interesting. Uh, so, Zahad, I'm curious, what is your take on that? Well, I think like, Figue is 100% right. And this is why I said that what Paladin is building is like necessary infrastructure for the space, right? Because, look, we're in this horrific bear market. And maybe we honestly, <laughs> I'm not trying to ask for anyone's, uh, not, not, not trying to, um, what's the word here? uh give the gods any bad ideas right but basically um we may not be anywhere near the bottom who knows right you never know and so but even that being said there was just an immense amount of wealth created in this last uh upswing of the market and uh, when you then look around at governance participation rates and the unique vote escrow um uh innovations that have happened across the curve ecosystem you know, you all, we all talk a really big game about like this ownership economy and extending democratic governance and distribution of wealth and all that kind of stuff through token. But then you look at the brass tax at the end of the day, and the fact of the matter is that the participation rates are super low. A lot of you have to kind of be, you know, first in and on the concentrated side of things to even have a chance of. Yeah, making a ton of money from the inflationary dynamics of some of these DeFi protocols. And so um, I think what Paladin is doing with governance technology in DeFi is a critical infrastructure, man. Like it's uh, really, really fascinating what these folks have done so far. And then, you know, I'm going to kind of look at, I'm going to go back a little bit to our, your, your guys' launch on our platform, right? Um, one of the key things that I thought was pretty interesting was, you know, we wrote this piece, which, you know, maybe we could add as an article. I know you can do that in Twitter spaces. I forget how to do it, but basically you can add tweets and stuff. So I'll dig this up and post it. But there's this improving governance participation, DeFi with better yield strategies, the Paladin LVP article that we wrote. And, you know, when we were sitting down, you guys, really what made this a, a successful launch, you know, from, from your perspective and ours is that, I remember speaking with some of your contributors um, in addition to yourself, but, you know, in separate conversations with contributors. And I was like, you know, what is, what does a successful launch look like for Paladin, right? Like, are you guys just trying to raise the most ETH you possibly can or whatever? And you know, like unanimously, your team basically said, honestly, we're doing this for price discovery. We want to know what the value is of what we're building for auto compounding, for staked Ave, for um, selling boosts, for curve LPs, you know, and all that. For, uh, for V curve holders, for VE curve holders, we just want to know what that price, what, what is the market price for that, right? And so I think that was really much in, very much in line from the beginning with what you folks are building and why it's important. Yeah. So actually it's, it's, it's kind of funny because uh, 
we've been uh, kind of fortunate, and I'm saying that in the totally ironic way, uh, when you see our build faces and uh, the market. So basically, there was a large crash in, in basically end, end of April when we did our LBP. And uh, we just released our latest product quest last month during the Luna crash. So we've been going counter cyclical uh, from uh, from the beginning of the year, which is kind of funny because we're arguably doing well. We did not raise uh, uh, tens of millions, but that was not the goal of the of the LBP. As you mentioned, we wanted to do price discovery. The reason why we did so is that uh, we had to start distributing uh, governance power, and we we've been we had been doing it through a non transferable token beforehand to our most hardcore followers. Um, we wanted to go to the next level because there's a huge design space that's only available to people who actually have a life token. Uh, what we've been seeing on top of the V token models that uh, we've been working a lot on and a lot of new models that uh, have been explored. Uh, and we needed to have that life token uh, for a lot of reasons, uh, regulatory, ethical, etc. We thought that just setting up a price and say to people choose to buy or sell was just a bad choice. And we've kind of been, I wouldn't say rewarded for that, but when you look at our token compared to a lot of the market, we've had a much softer fall in the sense that maybe we're minus 60% over the year where almost everyone is minus 85 to 95%. And uh, that's honestly sad, but it gives us an advantage in the same that we are in a good health. Our project has enough for a way to keep going. And more than that, we are actually entering uh, some kind of hyper growth phase where we realize that our latest product, which is called Quest, is uh, has a really good product market fix. We made roughly $30,000 on it this month. We're hoping to trex that next month. Awesome. I think like that's the key, right? Like when when you look at a lot of these token go up plays it's like i'm not saying they're good or bad right this space needs degens i've never ever talked shit about degens i think it's actually good behavior because it does it gives us a lot of things it gives us two in particular you one you already covered price discovery the second one is liquidity right and so like when you have and obviously the two depend on each other but like what's what is really interesting is then when you build something like what you folks have built where there is actually a solid route to revenue and there's a value that you're providing that makes money out of the magical internet money printing machine, right? And that's why we're really excited about this. This is what we, this is what we think the ecosystem is all about. Because, you know, uh, to take a sidetrack a little bit, you know, you look at something like Olympus, and people love to talk shit about Olympus, but um, Olympus is still making like fifty thousand dollars a day from selling bonds and from all the things that are not even its four hundred million percent APY or whatever you want to call it, right? It's just why you know we also see value in there and what they're doing in uh, providing a decentralized reserve currency and a bond market for DeFi. And in the same in the same way, like other people value that as well. There's a revenue stream from it. That's about as much as you can ask for under the abstractions of price and money as they are today, right? So, Oh, that's 100% true. I mean, uh, the fact that you basically uh, have revenue in a, in a crypto project is a huge thing, especially because there's actually quite a lot of projects that actually don't have uh, revenue. So you're making a big difference. And in the current market, uh, people who have revenue will not only uh, suffer much less from the bear market because they can actually simply pay their people they can afford, they don't have to loan out or look for fundraising, but they actually have so very foundational uh, basis that allows people to be confident in the project. I honestly also am, I wouldn't say I'm not bullish on anything, but I am a big believer in what Olympus has been building because they built a lot of smart things. So there are things that work, there are things that don't work. Uh, bonding has been a good place for, for money. I think another one that's very interesting is the fact that they introduced the concept very hardly of protocol on liquidity. What's very interesting about that, that of course it creates risk, but you're basically internalizing the market making that's necessary for the protocol to be liquid, at least part of it. So it brings two really important things. The first one is confidence. If the ship is going down, you're going down with the ship. And the second one, which is much bigger, is that you're basically getting the fees. So as long as there's gonna be speculation, there's gonna be hype around your project that you're going to keep building, you're basically earning fees. And this can become even more powerful because we have adopted 
that's pure protocol on liquidity strategy, but we have combined it with our knowledge of what has been happening in tokenomics, especially around the V token model. I just posted a thread this morning about it, but the, today, because everything crashed, there's a huge premium in the bribes marketplace. Basically, once you're buying uh, $1 of emissions, maybe on curve or on balancer, you're basically getting $2 of emissions. So $1 of incentives gives you $2 of emissions. So as a DAO, what we're doing is that we're basically buying voting power with our own technology and getting twice as much uh, emissions. But because we have protocol on liquidity, you can think of this as a method for us to distribute our token and getting CRV and BAL token at 50% discount, which is super powerful. And it's even better for us because we are specialized in our own governance. So there's no one better for us to distribute govern uh, our token than people who are actually locked into governance, uh, in into governance, right? So for us, we're actually in a very win-win situation in the current market. And uh, we're super excited about this because we just started farming BAL today. Awesome. Yeah, and I think like for, you know, when you look at the tireless building and next, next generation ecosystems, I think that that's like, you know, what what is the DeFi ecosystem right now if you sat down and kind of mapped it out, right? There's, I mean, God, I don't want to do that because we only got 45 minutes for this thing, but we could be here for a long time basically looking at the interconnections between the various players in the Curve Wars, Olympus, um, you know, not even getting out all the way to Uniswap and you know, Alchemex, all these big, all these players that are building weird services that to an outsider looks super weird, but if you get into it, is an ecosystem, right? And so, like for us, when you look at our product suite too, like what we're also really excited about is as you folks begin at Paladin, um, you know, get capture more of the folks who are out there with Staked Ave, with V V Curve, and honestly, V Bal. And a lot of the stuff that we're working on with VBAL as well, that's we've already posted about. I think there's just going to be a great opportunity to connect all of those together with value for holders and value for people who are actually doing things in the space, right? Providing value. Yeah, that's that's very obvious. I think uh, Prime DAO's main quality today is that you guys have built an onboarding, an ecosystem that can onboard new projects. So for those who are listening, uh, what's possible today is that you can go from the fundraising phase with uh, with Prime Launch to uh, the actual uh, bootstrapping phase with uh, potentially Prime Pools. And then once you want to go to the growth phase, start actually going with other DAO swaps, which actually thinking about how to grow. You have the deal-making phase with Prime Deals, right? So we're super excited to test this out because it's also helping us test all of our, all our hypotheses. And at Palin, we're really big, and I know you guys are the same. We, we share a lot of common value. That's very appreciated. Uh, we're very big on testing our solutions on ourselves. So that's why we have our own quest. We're going to use Word on ourselves on the on C, on it's ready. We we are we we're guinea pig for our own solutions because we're convinced we're building the best on on the market. And so if people don't believe so, that's totally okay. We'll just get hilariously rich, and then we watch on the sidelines. That's totally okay for us. Totally agree on that. And I would say that the testing, would you say actually that the testing period is the the basic um, benefit that you get in this process? Or what would you say that are the benefits that you get from being a part in the ecosystem, in the prime DAO ecosystem? Well, we uh, may be fundraising, uh, deal making, all of this. These are complex operations, right? And in traditional finance, you you ha actually have bankers or consultants that actually help you around this because most of the time it's your first time doing such a complex structure and you need people supporting you to actually have these. So our hypothesis when we started want wanting to work with uh, with, uh, with, uh, with with you guys was that uh, you would have more, exp were more experience and would be able to basically help us around this. And uh, I think this has paid off a lot. We were extremely happy about uh, about this. Awesome. Yeah, I think like that's you know that's really the thing because you could you know with our, with our with our platform with launch. There are any number of other platforms you can launch on. Right? You can just go. You can go to uh, uh, Copper. Um, or you know, Alchemist Copper, or you can 
you can just do it yourself. You can go to Dow House. You can do, I mean, when I say do it yourself, you can Cosmos, right? You can literally just go and start an app chain and bootstrap it. And you don't need a launch pad, although there might be one or two. But like the point being, of, uh, it's not really about the launch pad. It's that the products all connect in a way that hopefully help new DAO participants, new DAO start, no, new folks who want to start a DAO or even a protocol or whatever that will eventually be managed by a DAO. Um, it, it just makes it easy for them to access every step of that on their journey. And we're still building a lot of that journey, but at least you've got launch, you've got pools and you've got deals. And you know, pools will be live in a few weeks, and deals and launch are out there as it's rating. So, you know. Zahad, would you like to tell us a bit more about pools also? Yeah, definitely. So, like, pools, you know, I can, I'm happy to, we can also link, um, if you can, uh, if you can find the tweet where we announced it and post it in, I know you can post those to Twitter spaces or what have you, like, I don't know how you do that. That's funny. I sound like a total boomer on this. Oh, wait, it's the plus button? It is the plus button. Whatever. I'll get to it later. But anyway, the idea behind it is basically just making a way for, uh, for, the DAO liquidity management to be more cooperative. And you know, how would that actually work? Well, basically, we started by looking at the vote escrow tokenomics, right, that have become a pillar to so many DeFi projects across the space. Um, and what really caught our attention is we work super closely with Balancer, right? And Balancer announced VBAL uh, and went live with VBAL in March. And basically, um, what we were thinking is that when you look at the VBAL tokenomics, right, there's a number of things. If you haven't interacted with them yet, there's a number of things. Basically, you can earn it by you know, locking uh, BAL and wrapped ETH in their BAL, BAL wrapped ETH pool for anywhere from two weeks to a year. Um, the, you can then boost your liquidity provision rewards by 2.5x, right? And there's a number of other things you can get to. Those are the ones that stand out to me. But basically, what we thought here is that you know there's still kind of a problem with this is that gauge weight voting um, and uh, basically let me let me back up here. It, this is like a complex thing to explain from a blog post that's like the Twitter post, right? But basically, um, there's one of the things where I think is really interesting. Paladin is that. Um, you know, vote escrow tokenomics have a serious inefficiency as Paladin has discovered, right? Um, and this inefficiency also makes its, uh, raises its head in the VBAL market, right? And there are reward optimizers that, that came about from this. And Convex was really one of the first to play into this where they provided a platform for curve holders to vote lock their curve, right, through Convex. But that ends up giving substantial control of curve and convex or of curve and v curve to convex right and that's not really something that you potentially want long term for the health of that ecosystem and so you know you get these economic misalignments you get governance centralization right but we think that with pools uh vbal the vbal system can be optimized in a more synergistic way with prime pools right and so basically like the holders of the 2080 pool can convert their lp tokens to d to d val um and this basically is going to help you earn proportional protocol fees, VBAL inflation rewards, and we are going to kind of tinker with the governance in a bit, in a bit of a different way, right? So there's going to be 10% of the booster rewards that go to a common control pool to enhance VBAL ownership for the D2D bell holders, right? They're not just going to be concentrated off somewhere else in some in convex where you might not really have a state for how it gets used, right? And, um, and there's going to be a bunch of other things you're bringing to market around effective bribing, which we can get into later. But that's that's basically the ethos behind Prime Pools. The idea for it is that I don't necessarily think that anything that Convex or other folks are doing is necessarily wrong. It's just that it, it's worth experimenting to see if we can make some of the downsides out there a little more manageable when, you know, that's kind of what we're all about. Yeah. So I think that's something very interesting. Today we've developed two branch. Uh, in at Paladin, we have the pure governance branch, which is more about parameters control, was what we originally had developed for Paladin lending. So we're actually working on a V2 right now to have something a bit more efficient because it had uh, this uh, solution had a lot of failings. Uh, and we've been working on the other branch of governance, which is emissions control that uh, you were talking about. Uh, 
uh, around the V tokens. And this has been a substantial, we released it last month, and it's becoming more and more successful, which was very, we're very happy about. I think when you talked about the, the inefficiencies, there's something really important that we have to discuss, is that uh, these V models enable and incentivize people to build models around it, uh, to build more structures, wrappers, etc., which we have seen a lot on Curve and we're actually seeing a lot on Balancer. This is really healthy for the ecosystem because it strengthens a lot the V token in question, but it adds a lot of complexity. And the more complexity you have, the more inefficiencies are gonna appear because not uh, all actors are as sophisticated or can afford the gas fees to actually follow these complex strategies. So I'll give you a very quick example. Today, uh, the bribe market on VLCFX layer is as a much higher rate than on VCRV. The reason why that is, is that basically 90% of the bribes are happening on the convex layer, even though they only have 52% of the voting power. What does this mean? It means that you're basically overpaying the VLCVX, and because of that, uh, the VCRB holders are starved out of bribes, and so the price is driven down a lot on bribes. So basically, right now, you're paying three to five more when you're paying on the VL, bribing on the VLCVX layer compared to the VCRB layer. Now, I'm not saying people should stop uh, bribing on the VLCVX layer. There's a lot of reasons why you should keep going. But it's important to actually use these arbitrage opportunities to basically hover between the different layers. And that's the technologies we're building at Perlin. It's understanding these different inefficiencies in governance and enabling people to optimize around this. There is no one best route. It's always going to change depending on the prices of different wrappers, on the pegs, and on the different situations in which you are specifically in. So what I think is extremely interesting about Balancer is that what you're trying to build with prime pools, but which is, has always been at the core mindset of all of your products, is building the most aligned projects uh, on top of the others, which is a mentality we share. And the reason why I think we have a very compatible business is that you guys are focused on the fundraising and the deal making, while we're purely focused on the governance aspects, which means that we can complement each other to offer the best support to different projects that are actually trying to develop their activity and focus purely on building instead of having to manage these liquidity questions, these fundraising questions, et cetera, et cetera. Couldn't have said it better myself, man. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, that's that's great. And uh, another question related to the products. I mean, related to pools is very, very clear and the partnership, how that has helped you. Um, what do you see in the future of your organization in a sense that as you move forward, what being in this ecosystem, uh, what would be the best, the ideal um, collaboration that you would like to see with Prime Da and, of course, with the rest of the partners in Prime Da ecosystem? Well, uh, something we've been working on with you guys that's going to become more and more obvious as, as we get closer to Prime Pulse release is that we want to build flywheels. We are people who are actually going to try to enter the Prime ecosystem. Uh, are going to be able to uh, benefit from our governance services at minimal or no cost, simply because it will be so tightly integrated into the flywheel that it's going to become seamless. I mean, at some point, uh, projects shouldn't even have to think about how much they're spending to get a certain amount of emission. They, we, we could automate all of that and facilitate it pretty quickly with pools and, uh, and quests, to be honest. Uh, our long-term vision is much more complex than that because the truth is that we all know that tokenomics are uh, they're not eternal. So for example, Curse tokenomics will probably keep running and work very well, but almost no projects that actually has V tokenomics has prepared on over 300 years of emissions, right? Even Balancer, I think, is on 20 years. So depending on what they're scheduling next, they're going to have to rethink it. And there's new tokenomics that are going to be consistently invented because these are financial uh, structures, right? So we're going to have to keep adapting to all of these new projects, to all of these new ideas. So what am I expecting? I have no idea. I'm expecting to keep building on top of governance, 
to keep supporting governance experimentation and to keep helping the people who want to keep push forward governance uh, in actually succeeding in these endeavors. That's, uh, that sounds super exciting. And uh, Common Ground uh, would also request to talk. So please go ahead. Thank you, so nice. Uh, super happy to be up here. I'm Florian from Common Ground. We're a Web3 home for DAOs and uh, basically communities that use tokens uh, in many shapes and forms. And um, we have identified in particular one of the topics that was discussed here as a big problem for Web3 you know, becoming globally adopted, which is indeed that it's super hard seemingly for many users in Web3 to participate in governance. And I really like uh, some of the ideas that um, were proposed here to uh, make this uh, improve on this, on the protocol level, incentive level, token level, and all those things. Um, and I just wanted to both throw in that I think also in terms of accessibility, UX user experience, also explaining what governance is about, I think we can do a better job. But I also wanted to hear the voices of um, the experts um, what other challenges they see that should be or need to be solved for the governance innovation contained in this Web3 space to actually start to be practically implemented in, in the corporate world of today, in governments of today, in, in public private services, in public good infrastructure, and everywhere else where we think those governance models would actually improve today's uh, decision making. Should I take it? Yeah, or please. You... And then, or if you could also, could you repeat it and then give your take? <laughs> Just because my audio has been bad. Sorry. So from what I understood, uh... Common, I'm sorry, I don't have our oh, common ground has was just asking about uh, he was thinking that UX was one of the big uh, frictions in governance and uh, whether or not uh, which ones we believe this and which ones uh, do we did we had in mind. So first of all, UX is a big spine in all of cryptos. Uh, uh, it's a big thorn in all of cryptos, though, to be honest. Uh, it's a big problem. It's going to take some time for us to figure all of this out. I think it's a battle we're going to have to keep fighting. I do agree it's also true in governance, but I would kind of say it's a fake excuse for multiple reasons. Uh, I also remember a lot of people telling us before Snapshot uh, really rose to prominence that gas fees were a big problem for voting. But there was a study that was made by Tally that uh, basically showed that there was less than 20% correlation between gas prices and actual participation in governance. So what's really interesting is that right now with participation, we're probably tackling one of the oldest problems in the book, which is the fact that most people don't care about participating. So how do you solve that? If you look in democracies, people are going to ask you to vote maybe once, twice, thrice maybe, every five years, and that's it. And the rest is basically a hierarchy of professionals that are basically going to take these decisions and make all of this happen. So do we have to copy these models? I don't know. Maybe we can probably add a lot more transparency to them to be more efficient. Uh, but there's an obvious uh, ga uh, gap between the quality of governance we're having today in crypto and the actual needs we have. Um, I would also think that another one of the big uh, problems that we have is that we've been distributing token mainly to speculators and these people are not here to participate in the governance system. So that's a big question because uh, you were using today the tokens as a double standard. One is for fundraising slash speculating and the other one is for governance. So there's been a lot of talks, for example, should we separate both tokens? I think it's a bad idea, to be honest, but should we modify distribution? Should we, we be able to basically uh, modulate the governance power? Yeah, for sure, why not? At Paladin, we basically introduced a staking and locking system and you get boost in voting power depending on how much time you lock. So basically, the more aligned you are with the protocol, the more exponentially uh, exponential power you have around the governance system. And I think that this, I'm sorry, Zahad, uh, one thing. I feel that this totally makes sense because if you, if you're a contributor that you just bought the token to be a part of the community, doesn't necessarily means that you want to be um, all the time there 
and uh, participating in governance or taking decisions, or you might not have the skills that are the knowledge to do it. So being being able to give that power to another person, it's necessary and to give your power to a person that has more knowledge or cares more about the project. Because we say that we are in more and to participate, but in the end of the day, do we or do we have the time to actually do that? I think it's a good question because like the you know, you have this you see this pop up a lot where folks are basically saying that we that DAOs need to delegate more, you know, delegate what, delegate when. Like there's a lot of stuff around that, right? And um I think that we're sitting here in the midst of new coordination technology that's being built before our eyes. And so um, we should be putting that to work, you know, on itself, kind of like an Ouroboros, right? Like recursively. And so um, it involves two things, in my opinion. Part of this we do in Prime DAO, and the other part of it is the kind of tech that Paladin is building, where at the social layer, you need to be able to actually say who are the parties who are involved that we are delegating to, and what are the governance rights, and when do we actually say they should, they should be able to, what should they be able to do, what shouldn't they be able to do, and all that. And the rest is just that layer of enabling them to transact once we've reached quorum or whatever the way we decide to do it is right. So, yeah. Um, thank you so much for all those um, ideas. Um, I was wondering um, in the world of validation of blocks, uh, so the kind of underlying uh, layer where, you know, governance is now being introduced, for example, in the MEV space by Flashbots or in other ecosystems, I see it happening. Um, the the concept of slashing is kind of a, a, a well accepted method to create skin in the game and and ensure you know certain behaviors of validators. Is this something that you know governance or people who want to participate in the you know increase of the value of the token kind of have to subject themselves to kind of you know be active in governance in order to also have the the upside of of the you know value being produced through that governance is that maybe also a possibility or is this not, not applicable to governance from your point of view mm, well participating creates value for everyone in the ecosystem so in theory you're passively incentivized to actually be an, an active member of a, of a governance system the problem as chris we so eloquently said is that uh, well, it's very easy to accumulate tokens, right? Who has less than three tokens in their wallet? Who has less than five? Who has less than 10? How do you manage what's happening in 10 governance system? Even five is not possible, to be honest. So the problem you have is you get overwhelmed extremely quickly and you have to choose your battles. I think if everyone was at least participating in one or two DAOs, we would be much better off. But even then, it would not be enough. So the problem would not be solved. Um, it's interesting what you mentioned about moving up the stack of governance from purely dApps, let's say, to other infrastructure. Um, I do believe, depending on the type of infrastructure we're talking about, the governance system should be different. There is no homogeneous uh, governance system, per se. All of them are different. I would say Ethereum's governance, the blockchain's governance, is very, very different from a uh, dApp uh, governance. Uh, I'm not knowledgeable enough on Flashbots to actually... Uh, um, explain or give a comment on it. Uh, however, what I want to say, and uh, that's something I've been, uh, I, I wasn't always open about this, probably because I had a bias because we're building around governance, is that there are some dApps, there are some su subjects that do not need governance. And that we should not add a token for no reason at all. Uh, there is this concept of ungovernance or that has been explored that's very interesting, where we see projects like Rai or Liquity that try to be to literally have no governance and be automated. So my argument against them is very easy. If you have no governance, no one can update your con uh, your contracts uh, legitimately. No one can adapt to the new macro or the new game. You have to release a new a new product entirely and everyone has to migrate their liquidity. And uh, if there's a bug, you're just screwed with the bug. So having a monolithic block can can be very powerful. If you look at Liquidity's LUSD, there's a very strong incentive and uh, there's a very interesting uh, uh, movement behind it, but it has its, its, its cons too. So when you're building a product, you have to choose 
am I going to be able to just deploy it once on mainnet and then it starts running and it can never be touched again? Or should they have an upgradable model? And it's, if that's the case, you need a governance system, whichever it may be. Absolutely agree on that. Um, totally agree. It depends on the organization and it depends on the different jobs. And another question that I have, and I think that is the last one, and then I would love to give the, the mic to the crowd if you have any other questions. Um, so do you feel that with this model, is it possible to for a project to go to full decentralization since the beginning? Or do you feel that a project should start with a core team uh, taking decisions and then slowly, slowly by creating the different processes you can, um, you can bring the community to take decisions? I would say there's no perfect answer. You know, we keep saying there's no uh, there's no book to actually learn how to do this. That's very true. Uh, you have projects that have been very successful that started entirely decentralized, and you have projects that started centralized and are very successful. The project, the problem if you start entirely decentralized is the following: uh, you're going to have a very entitled base of people who are going to be deciders. And you're going to have a lot of trouble finding people who are going to need to execute the work. So you're going to have a lot of managers and very little people under them. So that's the biggest risk. And that's why you see people like Andre Kronje who rage quitted out of the, the ecosystem because people expected a lot out of him and it was not his job to do all of it. So that's that's a big risk, which can happen also with core teams where, P, where holders actually expect a lot from the core team but don't participate in the decision making. On the other side, when you start with a core team, the biggest risk you can have is creating a company in the sense that the more you grow, for example, you fundraise, you give equity instead of tokens or both to, fund, uh, to, a, a, com uh, to a, a fund, they are going to expect you to create profit and you're going to hire a lot of people. The problem by doing so is that you're basically creating an incentive that's going to be decoupled from the DAO because the DAO wants to become independent, the DAO wants to become profitable, but your company wants to grow and your company wants to become more profitable. So at some point you're either sharing the fees or one of them is gonna lose. But either way on the long term, both probably lose. I think the most elegant solution is something that I've seen at Prime, for example, where there's multiple companies that are basically being created. And as the team grows, instead of having one company that's growing, you basically, uh, members can leave and create their own company or more companies basically join the, the model. We don't talk about this officially, but the way at Pali that we have is that we have a, right now an admiral company that has some funds and basically all of uh, a lot of other companies that are working around it, helping us build uh, the way Paladin is. Uh, this is a model that we've seen, we've been seeing growing. For example, Aave has been decentralizing their core team. Uh, most of the big developers of the protocol basically left and created BGD, which is called Board Ghost Developers, I think. And they're basically becoming the developing strength of the Aave protocol but they're not inside of other companies anymore. I think that's an interesting model that uh, should keep being unexplored, uh, but there is no rule book. Like, let's do whatever we want and let's see what happens. Yeah, I think, like, that's a, all really good points. I think that there is no one answer to it, but I think that um, it all depends on how you rate you know, some of the things like the the financial and regulatory risk of your protocol because if you if it's something that you perceive or that you received counsel that is you know going to be very risky then it makes a lot of sense to decentralize it completely from the first you know from the day from the day that it starts there are a couple interesting examples from the last year I can think of but one in particular is potion potion protocol which to Fugue's point like these guys basically took the Kelly criterion and and built a DeFi primitive that essentially lets people have, uh, they call it democratizing risk management, um, essentially. And they, they fundraise for it by selling thousands of NFTs. And 
that did not go exactly the way they wanted it to go because they also raised from investors. They're going to be paying back the investors, getting off the cap table, and the NFTs themselves were all encrypted with a piece of the protocol itself. So that everyone had to work together to actually decrypt the NFTs and decrypt the protocol, which they did, right? And by that way, they're basically saying by that, that ceremony, they're transferring the protocol from VC ownership to be a public good, which is a pretty interesting concept and have it be fully decentralized under the control of the people who, per, who participate in the NFT sale from day one. Um, and of course, there's a lot of pitfalls in that. Now you got to get those people who are just look, like looking for like when NFT floor price you know, go up to be actually involved in uh, a complex asset management protocol, right? So it has its pluses and its minuses, but then there are other ones where I think like with Prime, we're we're not fully we decentralized, but we're on a path to it with each step we take. And you can see our posts and our medium where we really talk about how our governance has evolved from uh, where it started. And so um, that it's, you know, we've, we've progressively gone from a group of like 10 folks who are just like, let's build a thing and do some stuff to, you know, many different working groups with their own work group, working at their own organization or organizational structure, process and budgets. And, and it's managed to not be super corporate. Otherwise, I would have quit a long time ago because I am fucking allergic to that stuff. So, I totally agree. I think that the way to move forward is to kind of start with a small team and then by, I mean, the one model that you can see that you can create different small teams is creating an internal or an ecosystem to build a bigger ecosystem. So it's that we cannot survive alone, but by creating different ecosystem and different teams that they work independently is the way to collaborate and continue building together by becoming bigger and stronger. Um, thank you very much, everyone. And uh, yes, please, uh, come on ground, please go ahead. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I just wanted to uh, pile on a little bit on what was said on the potion uh, protocol because I also know the team and uh, was in some ways involved on uh, what they've uh, built with this NFT structure. And um, I think also it's a really interesting uh, example of solving actually a deep problem in DeFi specifically, mm -hmm. which is having a team of builders that is building a protocol but then needing to transition from building code to actually deploying and operating code. And if that code, as it is the case in DeFi by definition, is, uh, you know, the facilitating uh, trading, you know, options, for example, or other kinds uh, of things that are regulated under traditional securities uh, and markets regulation, um, it actually becomes quite a hard problem uh, to solve cleanly such that mm -hmm. the developer team does not have crazy legal exposure for some time until let's say decentralization is reached or whatever yeah. there are different you know attempts in the us at for example introducing a sandbox and hester pierce from the sec the crypto mom actually made such proposals on github even i think that was pretty cool um but nowhere yet this really exists and so i think what the potion guys tried to do is to uh find a model where there is a transition to community ownership of the protocol yep. IP in a way where it's a really interesting kind of open sourcing transaction. And yeah, I don't think it went uh, as planned. Unfortunately, I think the complexity was way too high and it kind of uh, hints at the second problem or point you made about it, which is that uh, it's super tough to find a community that's able to actually pick up on, you know, all the things that need to be done once such a transition to community ownership was done. I actually think in Potion's case, there is a lot to be said for the community that is now working on it. So um, I stay optimistic. Funny enough, Common Ground kind of came out of um, at least me learning a lot in this Potion experiment, which was that ah. there is a lack of real community-owned communication infrastructure. And uh, there was a question, how can NFT holders at Potion uh, who bought this NFT actually now communicate uh, in a private and kind of secure space to coordinate strategies, you know, for uh, revealing their uh, secret for the open sourcing or for, you know, deploying the protocol and doing token distributions. And 
uh, there was nothing, uh, and the the only kind of default was Discord, and Discord comes with all those security problems and data leaks and just inconveniences. And so, Common Ground is also kind of a result of uh, all those real world problems you have when you try to do something in a community first fashion. Uh, and so, we try to solve that. Yeah, and I think like you're spot on because I, I was a part of the NFT sale and. I'm in Barcelona where some of the core team works. So I, like we have seen them like here and there, uh, literally the day of the sale, I saw Andre, one of their, uh, executives. Oh, cool. okay. Yeah. I was like, you walking down the street and he was like, yo, don't miss the NFT sales. Like, of course, gotcha. Right. But, uh, it's pretty funny, small world, but yeah. Um, I think that that, you know, and then to this to Fige's point, right. Or I think it was Fige's talking about how some of the Aave developers transition out of Aave. That's kind of a, exactly what they did with Potion, right? That was the original point I forgot to make, which is that they then rebranded their research and development firm that maintains a Potion, but they have no formal um, in-writing sort of relationship anymore, which is a super interesting um, transition in governance, right? Also, before we, because we have only uh, six minutes, uh, please, but I'm not sure if I pronounce it correctly, but uh, please, uh, you can talk. Yeah, uh, hello, hello. Uh, yes, yeah, so like, uh, uh, I don't have much context on uh, the the chat that was going on here because I joined in a bit late. So, uh, like, since it's all about uh, DAO and uh, governance, uh, I just want to know your thoughts on how, like, how do you feel... Uh, DAOs would be uh, through fractionization of NFTs and uh, you know governance of the DAOs through the uh, through, through those fractional tokens. What are what are your views on it? Mm, maybe I'll start. I will be a bit brief on that. I'm not a big believer in fractional NFTs. Uh, you can just create a new RC twenty instead. Um, the big problem in crypto, and it's not specific to that topic, is I think we tend to overcomplexify things when there's simple solutions that work really well, maybe already in crypto or in the traditional world. And uh, on the other side of this is uh, uh, sometimes uh, we try to reinvent the wheel. We're like, we're going to create this really complicated thing, and we refuse to actually acknowledge that there are certain problems that have not been fixed in uh, the past solutions that will not be fixed by these solutions. I do not think fractional ownership solves uh, uh, fractional NFTs or, or this ownership solves anything that's not done uh, by dividing a token by two. So instead of having one token, I'm giving you 0 0.5 of, of, uh, of uh, something else. Uh, that said, there are some really interesting cases uh, with NFT governance. But uh, they would be rendered useless if you create, if you made the, the NFT uh, fractionable. That that's my opinion. It's probably very ignorant about it. Uh, I've been fully focused for the past uh, two or three years on DeFi, and uh, I literally have almost no NFTs. Uh, I can chime in and say that uh, fractionalized NFTs are most likely going to be regulated as financial instruments uh, very soon, uh, whereas unfractionalized NFTs that really uh, are not about, uh, you know, being secretly fungible, let's say, uh, will stay most likely unregulated for a while longer. So I think that's a kind of side point to keep in mind on, on that. Understood, understood. Uh, Lunar Punk, do you have any thoughts on this? Nope, I'm not a fractional NFT holder myself. I'm nearly not... Um... I'm the wrong person to ask because I hold a small amount of NFTs and the only ones that I've, only that I've ever hold are ones that I considered functional in some way. <laughs> so uh, I'm the I'm the exactly wrong person to ask. And, you know, on that front, it's more like uh, I'm very much interested in um, Plastics.io is a company that I supported. They're building an NFT marketplace for plastic reclamation where they're basically using Plast, uh, NFTs is a uh, way to coordinate behavior around single-use plastics. Basically, they use uh, the w people who can go into any store, including one in Barcelona here at the Nescafe store. You can go in, deposit your single-use plastics from coffee pods. They mint an NFT and sync it with your MetaMask wallet. Uh, when, the, when Nescafe retires that single-use plastic out of 
circulation, yours and among, amongst a whole bunch of others, maybe sells it to Veolia or one of the ma major recyclers, you get a nice little NFT, you get some reimbursement because you hold the NFT. So it's pretty, it's pretty cool on that front. But I don't think like, I don't have an opinion of fractional NFT ownership. I know there are doubts for it, but I don't really, not my thing. Um, before we close, one last question and then, uh, yeah, thank you all. So, Celia, you can go. Thank you. Um, so I just have kind of a broad question. I'm, I'm very new to um, crypto and Web3 and excited to learn. And um, thank you all for helping me do that today. Um, but I just have, I just have a question about modeling for governance and how much, um, you know, obviously you don't want to reproduce like contemporary politics um, and uh, that kind of uh, structure. Have you looked much at uh, alternatives that already exist in the world, like the Mondragon um, Collective in Spain? And then I was also curious, and this is maybe too big a question, on how much um, auditing is going on with uh, the voting in DAOs, like looking at who's actually voting um, and like correlations between who's voting, who they are. I, I'm just like, you know, excited about um, the potentials for Web3 and wouldn't want to see kind of contemporary politics or power structures just reproduced in this space. Uh, well, I'm happy to take this one first because I think it's already too late in some ways. They already are, right? And like, mm -hmm. I, what, what I think we have to do is make sure like, I don't think, I don't think, you know, Fige, I'm not putting all the weight of this in the world on your shoulders, but I think, you know, things like what Paladin's building are, uh, really interesting, and I think that we have to be doing more experimentation in this space, and definitely learning from the history of governments in this space, right? Like you mentioned, Mondegrom. One of the things uh, uh, I have a I have a podcast, and one of my first guests was Nathan Schneider, who's um, the wrote one of the platform the platform cooperative um, movement manifesto back in the year back in the years a few years ago, and and then came up with exit to community as one of the core things, um, uh, uh, core new things that he wanted to see in tech, and. One of the things he says is, you know, like one token, one vote is fine, but in a lot of ways, you've already seen that it reproduces the inequality that's out there in the rest of the world. And I'll tell you, with Prime's governance, we're we're experimenting with with, with reputation. So our NFTs, there are NFTs that hold a certain amount of voting power, and you can see this. If you go into a deep DAO, you can see all of our our you can see our votes in boardroom. Mm -hmm. You can see who holds these in deep DAO, and we're not, as I mentioned before, in a spot where we think that we should be fully decentralized with D2D determining the outcome of everything yet, right? Um, but I do think that I'm not super familiar with the vote audit side of things, but I know there's paper, there's published papers on on this mm -hmm. for sure mm -hmm. that get into like some of the problems with this. And the number one, one of the major ones that I think at least Paladin will have an impact on is governance participation by proxy. Because you look at governance participation in general, it is just... You want to talk about like people like to dunk on the United States for governance participation at like say fifty six percent or something like that. The average DAO is less than ten or something like that. It's crazy. It's very very bad. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Well, thank thank you. <laughs> uh, I can also complete a bit that answer if you're okay with it, of course. Um, there's. It's actually very important. I agree it's too late. We've already made some decision make, uh, decisions, especially, for example, token voting, that for a lot of projects are sunk cost in the sense that today, when you're a multi-billion dollar protocol that has raised millions from VCs, you cannot really stop token voting, like not easily, simply because you have literally legal and financial obligations to actually create value and to let these keep going. So that's already a sunk cost for a lot of old and pre-existing projects. I think there's a lot of experimentation that has been made and a lot more that needs to be made. Something that we're underestimating a lot is that uh, blockchains are the biggest social uh, sandboxes we've ever had. So before blockchains existed, uh, once you write an economic or a political uh, thesis, you had a theory, you had to wait for years to be published for someone to actually help you and test it out on a small scale. Today, mm -hmm. you can just code it yourself or find someone to code it and test it out. So in the next 10 to, uh, to 10 to 50 years, we're gonna have exponential experimentation around governance, around social coordination, etc. And it's gonna be extremely fascinating. We mm -hmm. can expect our society to dramatically change in the next 50 to 100 years because of that, in a good or in a bad way, to be honest. And mm -hmm. we all have the responsibility around to keep making sure this is going in the right direction. However, and I think that's very important, um, 
crypto governance today is not working as intended. There are some very quick fix we can try out. Uh, but the biggest one is simply applying previously used methods, creating councils, having a lot of delegation around. Uh, I agree that what was just said before, our biggest long term, medium term focus is developing uh, proxy voting solutions. And I don't mean the delegation or something, but thinking as a way for people to have easier access to actual governance information. The biggest problem we have today around governance is that there's a lot of work. There are huge uh, challenges. The problem is you will never earn money over governance. When mm -hmm. you ask for a paywall, you're basically adding friction. So it's disincentivizing people to actually participate. So the problem with that is that you need to find a solution to actually push for the governance system while also having revenue. The quote unquote easy solution is say, oh, but we can have a public goods system and it's basically going to be funded by people. The problem with that is that the people who fund are going to be people who have a financial interest or who actually have a way of earning money. So you cannot have public goods funding without speculation. Mm -hmm. So the mm -hmm. other way around is to actually have a two-sided business model, one that accepts that there are corrupted parts in governance and that you need to build with them, and the other that's going to try to push forward and thrive in this ecosystem, which is what we're trying to do at Parlin. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Vic, for that great explanation. Um, and unfortunately, our time is up. I would love to sit more here and talk about it, um, talk more about governance and more about the ecosystems. Um, if anyone was, would like to join our Discord and have more discussions around that, then you can find the link on uh, Pint, on the Twitter space. And um, I would love to have a further discussion later on within the upcoming max, uh, months with you, Fit, and everyone, and come ground also. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming, and uh, see you very soon. You can find, you will be able to find the recording also on our YouTube and uh, probably on our Spotify. Thank you, everyone.